Okay. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, social media data. I don't need to lecture this group on the high prevalence, diverse character, and widespread use of social media data. Social media surround us. Social media, as I gave a nod to this morning, simultaneously, they simultaneously offer a mirror of our health situation. We may post to Facebook when we're feeling ill or staying home because of a bad cold, possibly the flu. Um, we may share um, some aspects of our uh, of our medication uh, challenges on Twitter. At the same time, social media shapes our health behavior, shapes our knowledge, attitudes, beliefs with respect to um, uh, these conditions. It shapes our awareness of risks, uh, like bad air quality, for example, due to tweets from public health agencies and due to uh, you know, norm shaping um, more broadly. In some cases, messaging as to health or pro uh, products or, um, or risk factors come through Twitter. We may receive tweets promoting Juul as an e-cigarette platform, for example. Um, so social media platforms are not only prevalent, widely used, and diverse, but they are key factors in understanding health behaviors, understanding influences on health behaviors. Now, within this sphere, we need to distinguish critically between two types of social media. This makes all the difference in the world at a practical level. We need to distinguish between self-publishing platforms, shown in green here, which are deliberately chosen to put information out there for the world to see, and platforms which are intended for private communication, shown in black. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Tumblr, LinkedIn are sites where we have people following each other, we're sharing information, say in my profile, others can see it. They are self-publishing platforms. And ethics boards, called um, internal review boards in the States, or research ethics boards here in Canada most typically, are very interested in this, in this distinction. Because uh, in the public sphere, the public forum, such as uh, achieve with Twitter, we can listen in uh, without uh, needing to get explicit consent from everyone on Twitter to whom we're listening, because they are putting it out there and sharing it with the world in a public sphere. By contrast, Facebook updates, we need to get very strong insurances of consent from an individual because that is meant for private communication with themselves and their networks. So we need to distinguish very strongly between these types of, of platforms. Social media, with those provisos, provide a glimpse of diversity and express attitudes and beliefs across large swaths of the population. Um, high or low socioeconomic status and uh, position, different levels of education, I'll make use of, of social media. Certain social media forums tended to be used by, by others. LinkedIn, a lot of professionals and those uh, in, the, uh, in, in office jobs are on LinkedIn. Twitter also tends, skews towards a higher income bracket. But at the same time, um, they are used by broad swaths of, of the population. Uh, changing attitudes towards privacy in public, uh, in public and platform developers and regulators means that this is a changing target over time. There's profound diversity amongst the different platforms, and social media is notable 
as, again, a mirror of our situation in the world, because we, we post on there our digital shadow, as it were, highlights our situation in the world, but it shapes our, our opinion. And it's effective as a targeted social media tool as well, or social marketing tool, and in fact, product marketing. Um, there's really a strong worldwide variation in platform use. Um, uh, within this room, I know we find broad patterns of use between different people. Um, uh, so, uh, for example, Viber has a strong uptake in, in the South Asian community. Um, uh, WeChat um, in in East Asian community in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, Facebook, uh, particularly strong in some areas, and there's there's even some communities using I think MySpace still in, in the world. Um, uh, so. So th there are differences across different groups in the preferred platforms. Um, and there's pronounced differences in the types of content. Instagram and Snapchat, well, you young people in the room have forgotten more in the past few months than I've ever known about those platforms or what content is on there. But it's a very different sort than we read on Instagram. And it requires to really make use of of things like Instagram and Snapchat, well, particularly Instagram, um, uh, we really would need to get into image processing, probably. Start looking for, for trying to make sense of the images. This gets into Cheryl's comments. How much processing do we need to make use of this data? Well, if you're into, if you're into Instagram and making sense of Instagram posts to try to understand if someone eating at different times, you might be in a great shape. You, you could recognize periods when they're eating and where they're eating. That might be of real interest in understanding their food-seeking behaviors, um, the degree to which they're eating out, et cetera, what sort of things they're eating because they're sharing photos of their, of their meals. But at the same time, to recognize that, we might need machine learning to say, is this a photo of food? And believe me, you know, I can assure you there's people working on that. And in the fullness of time, those in my lab will be working on that. So, um, you know, there's there are different, different types of contents, uh, different indications of influence. On Twitter, we have likes. On other platforms, we may have retweets or, or shares, right? Um, <clears throat> There's different ways in which we might upvote content in terms of significance. And different ways in which we might indicate interest in this content or that it's significant even if we don't agree with it. Um, and uh, these are all quite platform specific. Um, Self-publishing platforms, again, are notable for their lower barriers to ethical use and public forums as forums for expression, giving a pulse of discussion, understanding what messaging is current, what are people discussing um, within, a, uh, within a context. And I'm going to focus down here on Twitter, not least because we have a, um, a Twitter set of Twitter data um, gathered here in Western Canada that's now several hundred million tweets in size uh, and growing, even, ladies and gentlemen, as we speak. Um, and that's thanks to good work by Sal Yen um, and others. So Twitter, uh, if we look worldwide, it's got about 325 million users. Uh, there are about 100 million active users. These are a few years old now. And um, during peak periods a few years ago, the tweet volume was about uh, 10,000 tweets a second coming out on, on Twitter. Not a small amount of data. And from our work, we seem to have found we seem to have found maybe 2 to 3%, I think it's closer to 3% of tweets are in some way health-related, plausibly health-related. They may be about vaccinations, they may be about being homesick, they might be about attitudes towards you know, concerns about recent cases reported in the news of, of West Nile virus, but at some levels they're health-related. Um, many tweets are either geotagged or tagged with places that can allow you to understand where they may be from. Maybe it's very coarse grain like Saskatchewan, 
maybe it's very fine-grained like this GPS location. Um, there's some wonderful work by colleagues at McGill that seeks to go from a variety of types of evidence, including not just the tweets from a given person, but who they're connected with, to infer where that person might be located. And that can, I believe the argument is that can get 35 to 40% of all tweets can be geolocated based on that, based on that evidence, which is very significant. Um, you can filter tweets as they come in by content, by time, by geography, and very crudely, and I, I'm not even sure I want to, to say this without a you know, giant caveat by sentiment. You know, is it like vaccinations or dislike vaccinations? What have you? Um, maybe it's anger at people who oppose vaccination, and it comes out as a negative sentiment. It doesn't necessarily mean it's against vaccination, and it's, it's fairly crude. Retweeting provides some indication of interest or, or, or agreement or, or at least assessment of significance um, and probably support. Um, and you can do streaming analysis as well as some retrospective analysis. Um, tweets come in a wide variety of forms. And uh, this is, these are some tweets from suicide. And I have to apologize for the language in some of these. Um, these are tweets that reference suicide. And one thing that should stand out if we look at the, the text of these tweets, first of all, it is uninspiring content. The second thing is that it is very, it, you can't go from saying a tweet that mentions suicide is suicide related in a serious way or is, is, shows suicidal ideation, far from it. Some are just mentioning a movie called Suicide Squad, of which I'm innocent. Um, and uh, and uh, at the same time, some might involve jokes, or maybe jokes. For example, I'm out of bacon. This is my suicide note. Probably a joke. I would hope. <laughs> you know. Um, the third one. Probably a joke. Um, very likely a joke, but I'm not totally certain. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not positive how to interpret all of these. And there, therein lies the rub, right? Um, you, you can't just take them at face value. You have to do processing. And you end, when she, uh, she comes here, she'll be talking about processing these to try to more rigorously classify them as the content. But suffice it to say that doing so requires a supervised learning technique that systematically goes through <laughs> Many, many tweets. I think she went through 10,000. I think Xiao Yan and I both have gone through thousands of these. Um, with, um, you know, in, 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 yeah, in days that, that I wouldn't wish on other, others. But we classify, is this a tweet which meets a certain criteria? Much as for a systematic review, we might, um, uh, we might classify a paper, does it meet certain criteria? Here are opioid-related related tweets. Um, you can see the variety of different sentiments expressed, right? I miss who my cousin was before fentanyl. That's, that's a meaningful, uh, meaningful tweet. Um, um, the first one, maybe promotion of, of opioids and other, other uh, substances. Um, um, you know, here's someone celebrating being off of opioids, right? Um, uh, here's someone taking opioids. Um, I love it when I find treasures in my, measure, in my, my medicine cabinet. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's not as bad as yesterday, but I have to call my sister and like, please, I need to take more morphine, right? Um, it looks like instead of studying for my midterm, I took six hits of heroin. Um, uh, some of these are worrisome. Some are borderline, I'm not sure if it's a joke. Um, others are definitely, um, definitely have, have some elements of, of concern. Some are cautionary, right, uh, suggesting the Loxum kids. So Twitter gives this picture of this discourse that is extremely varied when it comes to these points of concern, when it comes to opioids, 
when it comes to things like uh, cases of illness, when it comes to cases like suicide. Um, and there's temporal patterns that you see in it. For example, um, this is for Saskatchewan, um, uh, Saskatchewan discussion related to smoke or smoky um, on different days. And you can see when air quality advisories due to forest fire smoke was in effect. And you can see a high correlation here in terms of uh, relation to the patterns. Um, uh, here, um, news events. Uh, I think this was for the Colts and Bushy shooting. Um, and you can see you know, a spike of interest and then decay over the span of successive days on each successive day. There's a stock and flow dynamics here, ladies and gentlemen, associated with awareness and associated with uh, declines in awareness. Um, uh, there's a rich, um, uh, rich uh, Twitter interface you can use online. This is um, provides uh, searches and, and for places, and TweetDeck is another, another um, uh, positive uh, product that is evolved over time. Um, what are some weaknesses? So this data is sometimes uh, substantive in terms of capturing elements, small, short elements of narrative context. It has links, it has retweets, it has likes. It has longitudinal information, who's posting this, et cetera. What's not to like? Well, there's some weaknesses. There's some notable weaknesses here. There's a disproportionate focus on a certain popula vocal population segment. I'm on Twitter secretly. I don't post any tweets on Twitter. Like people searching for my Twitter feed. But, um, I don't have any. I don't have any tweets on online, um, but there's some people I know that tweet a lot, um, and uh, the tweeting is 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 quite different. Um, it's not an equal sampling of all voices, a representative sample. Precise geographics filtering is is challenging. Um, tweet brevity can raise interpretation challenges. Acronyms, much less, you know, sort of. Uh, brief ungrammatical spellings or what have you. Um, sentiment analysis that's built in, I, I find uh, pretty weak from my own observations. If you want to subscribe to the streaming in a naive way, it's a 1% random sample of all tweets. Um, again, it's a lot of tweets worldwide per second, but you're getting a few tweets. Uh, fortunately, and I think I've provided you with code bases, and if I haven't, you know, you're welcome to them, uh, whereby you can get it for certain geographical areas over time. So yeah, has particularly strong experience configuring those for, for our own jurisdictions in Canada, uh, provincially, and for, um, for Australian colleagues. Uh, flexibility requires some amount of programming or paid services. There's an extremely expensive um, a tweet uh, purchase set of options, which um, to purchase retrospectively. Uh, I regret to inform you that I've not found any discount for academic um, purposes, and colleagues elsewhere have confirmed that they've encountered the same problem. We inquired, I think, for one month of data from from um, uh, Montreal for the flu pandemic and we were quoted a price in the thousands of dollars uh, for just the Montreal area. Um, we collected ourselves, and we have it since 2000, late 2006 because of this. Um, hundreds of millions of tweets. If anyone's interested in tweets, let's talk. Um, uh, so it does require a certain amount of, of programming. There's this great product, a uh, very interesting product called Social Feed Manager, which is an open source project, which actually had a lot of functionality with it, but it has some security vulnerabilities. So you can talk with Lutiet um, about that if you want to learn more, and he can share with you some of our discoveries about it. Um, we're also glad to help equip you. We've set up people to help, like Diana set up these Australian collaborators for monitoring. Um, uh, I will say that 
a big challenge for social media platforms in general is staying abreast of platform changes and, uh, and shifts in platform use. Um, uh, I will note that when it comes to advisories and media buys, there's a particularly strong potential for use a tool like Twitter to understand how do people respond when there's a public health advisory, say from the Saskatchewan um, Public Health or from Saskatchewan Lung Association. If the Lung Association sends out an advisory on Juul, how do people react online? How do different subgroups react? Are there snarky messages that are put out questioning that message? Are certain aspects of that message and not others amplified? How long does the effect last? How much discussion is about? Twitter data can provide a lot of understanding of those dynamics. If you look at the dynamics for the Colton Bushy shooting, tragically, or another tragedy, the Humboldt Broncos hockey crash, you'll see pronounced dynamics associated with them over time. As awareness is raised, as awareness falls, as reminders uh, occur. And with media advisories and postings, uh, messaging um, from, from um, social media campaigns, from public health agencies, data like this can be golden. I would note for those from um, the Chinese speaking area of the world, I'm extremely interested in possibilities of, of uh, uh, monitoring on, on platforms uh, online for social media in China, and I'm wondering what the APIs are like. Uh, our own uh, observation is each API are, are different, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to learn from what's possible uh, overseas as well. Um, uh, okay, um, I think I'll, I'll uh, skip, uh, skip that. Um, right, okay, um, right, um, good. Okay, so that was some aspects of social media and with a particular focus on Twitter. Uh, Yuan will be coming here shortly for a tweet-related case study. But are there any questions I can answer on the search side or on the Twitter side before I talk a little bit about uh, data from smartphones and wearables? Any questions? How well described is the Twitter using population right now? So if you're going to try to make, you know, this yeah. big, big picture, broad inferences about who's talking. Yeah. I think um, this is a good question. Um, there, my understanding is there there have been some studies done. I'm not aware of them recent recently, um, and I'd want to refresh what's known now because over time these things change a lot. Um, you know, uh, five years ago, I'm not sure Snapchat was around for the youth. Um, um, and you know, when I was young, um, we had these we had these things called zeros and ones. And when Mark Kyle was young, all they had were zeros. Um, no, okay. um, but uh, that was a joke, a computer joke from the nineteen eighties. Um, it was about a, a older generations. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, I, I don't know, but these things change every few years, and I don't know of any recently. What I do know is you'll probably find in the marketing sphere probably quite a lot of profiling of who's online and, and different uh, groups um, that, that, that might be uh, you know, uh, lurking on, because there's the difference in who's posting on Twitter and who's lurking on Twitter. There's a lot of Twitter lurkers who, who get Twitter messages but aren't necessarily posting, I lurk. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'd love to update our understanding of what's going on. Maybe one of the students, one of the TAs, as you're listening to this boot camp, maybe you could try to find recent articles studying um, profiles of the Twitter population by characteristics for certain regions like, like North America or, or, or US or Canada. Other question? Yeah. So um, emojis are very. Yes. Yes. I don't even have to finish the question. It's like. Indeed. So do you actually, uh, or do you know anyone who incorporates emojis? Yes. Oh. Yes. There's some wonderful recent work. Um, so 
we have, I will, I, I, um, I stand to be criticized, and hence I said, um, uh, to here, um, because our Twitter harvesting work started very early in 2016, and we weren't careful to capture the special characters associated with emojis. Emojis provide a huge amount of extra understanding for tweets that contain them. Um, uh, sentiment is one part of that, but it can include other, other components as well. And um, there's been some really good work recently that seeks to go beyond textual analysis of Twitter, which is what we've done and what others have predominantly focused on, to analyzing um, uh, these additional cues likes and retweets and emojis. We have done some work on things like um, who is sending it. And, and also time when it's sent can be a clue um, as to something about its context. Uh, um, for example, quite a lot of Twitter um, these days is sent by bots. It's sent by things that are not humans. They are they are generating content for a purpose, and they masquerade as a real account, but they are sending out information that is actually in an automated way. And time can clue you into some parts of these. Um, what time of the day it is sent out. Um, and there's been some wonderful work done on distinguishing bot accounts from real Twitter accounts, um, or group accounts or um, social, or kind of accounts that are not really a person, but are just a, a front person for that. You know, Justin Bieber or something. Um, you know, maybe he has someone tweeting for him rather than going around and, you know, in the middle of a song, you know, tweeting something out. And so um, there's been some neat work doing to try to distinguish um, individual users from, um, from bots and from um, uh, sort of um, institutional or or um, uh, or sort of nominal accounts for a person that are really uh, a collection of people, um, and uh, and part of it's the use of emojis and links is another thing, right? Including including uh, URLs um, in there can provide you a lot of additional content if you follow them and you look what's there, it can clue you in something to what's going on in the tweet. Is it a promotional tweet, for example? And uh, some good work has, has sought to do that. Um, we, sadly, have not yet uh, followed uh, suit. We, we uh, uh, were uh, working on some aspects of infrastructure, tying it into dynamic models, and we'll get around to that in the fullness of time. Probably over this coming year, we'll be harvesting emojis more effectively. Chayanne and I have to put our heads together about that. Um, Lugia has confirmed that our harvesting of emojis is, uh, is uh, shall we say, uninformative. Um, so, so it's a very important area of, of insight, and it's one that historically we don't capture, but which we need to capture, but others are starting to use to really sharpen analyses. So thanks for that excellent question. Other questions? Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, it is in the nature of things um, that in the fullness of time, the student succeeds the master. Um, and I'd like to introduce to you, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you um, uh, a, a student who rightfully is taking on leadership positions, Yuan Tian, uh, sitting here in the back. Uh, Yuan has uh, come to us following a long day at Health Quality Council. Um, where for many years she led the um, uh, Saskatchewan Ministry of Health project on modeling ED weights and patient flow. Um, Yuan is also notable for um, her, her current uh, pursuit of a, a doctoral uh, degree within our uh, program and our lab. Uh, we're pleased to work with her. And one of the many areas that she has contributed um, is um, in um, tweet processing and classification. And she has kindly offered to uh, lend us a case study um, where she describes uh, one of her projects in this area, a project 
that like Daphne's face has launched, if not a thousand ships, other projects mining tweets within our group, such as those being pioneered now by Zuru. Um, so, uh, Yuan, would you like to present from your laptop? Yes. Okay. So, uh, why don't you uh, come to the front, and I will um, uh, turn the spotlight, as is rightfully done, over to you. And I will stop the recording here.